Sipping on some sip, sip, sipping. Hi, everybody. I'm Vince. And I'm Emily. And you're listening to The Lighthouse Lowdown. I definitely almost forgot to click that. It was already recording for minutes. Uh, the, the intro. Oh, well, you nailed it. Thank you. Thought you were saying the recording button. We're nailing it. Normally, I'm on your side of the table, but Vince is in charge for this episode. Welcome to it. Tell us all about it. Today, uh, <laughs> we're first of all, first, history buoy. Oh, right? yeah. All right. So today's history buoy is inspired <laughs> by your last episode when you talked about the anatomy of a lighthouse. Okay, very nice. The lightning rod. This specific? We're going to talk about the history of lightning rods. Whoa. <laughs> and then how they got to use on uh, lighthouses, which is why we're here. Very nice. First, I'm going to take a sip. The unofficial sponsor of the moment is Emily providing Starbucks. Oh, I was like, sp- I'm the sponsor? <laughs> that would be true. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yes, we are. Okay. Benjamin Franklin is credited with the founding of the idea of the lightning rod. So. Because he used a. Benny Frankie. Because he used a, was it a key, a key. or something? Okay. Yep. So I'm going to, a lot of the things I'm doing today are reading quotes, and many of them later are coming from lighthousefriends.com. Excellent. So. And you look like a teacher right now. Because so. I'm wearing glasses. <laughs> <laughs> Benjamin Franklin suspected that lightning itself was electricity, given its similar color, crackle, and configuration. Noting that a pointed metal needle could draw electricity from a charged metal sphere, Franklin became convinced that a metal rod could coax lightning from the sky. Why? So it would not strike, (laughs) excuse me, so it would strike the rod instead of the buildings or passerbys. Yeah. So I've never really considered that before, that lightning rod's intent is actually to direct for people, like not buildings, but also people. This is related and unrelated, but remember when I talked about that, the lighthouse where they connected the lightning rod to the stairway of the lighthouse, that Uh was metal. Oh no. (laughs) Was someone on the stairway? Uh, Yeah, but he survived. You're Ugh. stealing my diagram. Yeah, so he got shocked. Yes, bad. but he was okay in the end. One he was time. paralyzed for a little while. Mm. I know. Horrible design chance. And what? now, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no. I, I'm sorry, I'm trying to take Please. over. This is and now what? No, because you're talking about the lightning rods. That's all right, what? I was just going to say that nowadays lightning rods are like connected to a copper wires that direct it. That's right. To the ground. I am so sorry. Please no, continue. I right. want to learn from you. Let's talk about metallurgy for just a second. Ooh. Copper wires. So it can be any type of wire that is conducting. Okay. Like aluminum doesn't conduct electricity. So. Okay. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah. It's, it's non-ferrous. Uh, ferrous metals are, uh, well, actually, no, that's, that's um, magnetism. Sorry. Okay. Uh, the best conductors for electricity among them are silver and gold. Silver is like one of the very best. Originally, power lines were silver. Oh. But it was too expensive, and I think people were stealing them. Oh. They were like taking down the wire, because imagine running wire made of silver, yeah. at least silver composite, crazy. So copper is like the next step down for cost and also conductance of electricity. So that's okay. why copper is used in wiring. Yeah. But there are some components, especially in like microchip levels, that are gold and silver. Uh, even in iPhones, I think they use those as well. Yeah. So like it's all around us, super expensive for multiple reasons, but super conductive of electricity. So some lightning rod cables are made of different materials. Mm. One we're going to talk about is made of silver, and I think it's a dual purpose we'll talk about. <gasps> it's very exciting. Very exciting. <laughs> so um, back to Benny Frankie. All right. Um, the Ben. The big Ben. So legend has it, we talked about this, but Franklin hopped on a horse in the year 1752. Gosh. Which I've never considered when this happened with a key on a kite. And he needed the horse because there wasn't enough wind. It was a rainstorm he was yeah. doing this in. Uh, and I don't know if this is multiple times or just once, but the legend goes, he rode the horse, pulled the kite, which sounds hard on its own. Yeah. And then observed that the key would get struck by lightning, uh, at least on one occasion. So that was his confirmation that lightning is drawn to a metallic object if it's high up in the air. And it's kind of unique. Yeah. It's, it's on its own. It's, isolated. it's like lightning is more likely to hit this piece of metal yeah. than somewhere else. Yeah. I saw a, a TikTok a um, week or two ago about like a physics professor. I tried to find it, but I can't find anything on TikTok after it's gone. But he was um, 
explaining lightning rods and how electrons are actually traveling off of the end of the rod because of its pointy shape and how electron travel will create the best path for electricity to travel through. What? So the lightning actually strikes the rod and goes down to the cable because it's the best path of least resistance between the source, uh, the cloud, mm -hmm. the thunderstorm, and the earth. So all electricity wants to go to ground. It wants to ground itself. So if you're um, shocked, if you're electrocuted, it's because the energy is passing through your body to the ground. Yeah. So that's why they, they have isolating shoes, like rubber-soled shoes will help mm -hmm. you from being electrocuted. Um, but you won't feel the electrocution unless you're the termination of the source. So like you can pass electricity through your fingers between two sources without pain. But if you were to jump the gap and have a shock go off your fingertip, that it would hurt. Yeah. So lightning is an extreme event of that. Interesting. Yeah. Pretty neat, pretty neat, pretty neat. I've seen pictures when people get uh, electrocuted, sorry, when they get shocked by lightning, that they have like holes in their shoes where the mm. electricity exited. Mm. I'm like, God. <laughs> oh, when I was a kid, we had a jacuzzi behind our house. Um, of course, we had a hot tub. And there was this little like Bougie. pump or something. I think it was a cleaner that my, my parents would put in there. Mm -hmm. And it was electrical. And I guess it wasn't fully sealed anymore. There's a copper wire exposed oh, or something Lord. because my siblings and I, ah. we could touch the water and you'd feel it like me, you know, fingertip. Who is letting you touch the water? Our parents weren't there <laughs> <laughs> and it was oh, really God. mild and I touched it and I was like, I can't feel anything. Well, it's because they all had their shoes off, I, I think. And they were allowing electrical current to pass through them through the water because water is highly conductive. Your siblings. Well. Yeah, and so I took my shoes off and I could feel it too. Oh my I'm gosh. pretty sure that happened. It might be a false memory. But it I'm could pretty be a sure. dream you had when you yeah. did a bunch of electrical research. Yeah. <laughs> um, but here we are, two and a half centuries later, after the key in the sky on the kite, uh, lightning rods persist. They are decorative architectural pieces, vestiges of the past, and mitigators of lightning's power. So my next note is to ground. I was going to tell you electrical's path yeah. to ground. But... Um, a lot of lightning rods that you'll see now are actually an architectural style choice and they're not actually lightning rods, meaning they make them intentionally not conductive materials so they're not a lightning rod. Why? But they chose them because there was a period where lightning rods became, so they were scientific, they were proven to be useful yeah. through lots of different ways and then they were seen on the top of pristine, uh, prestigious buildings, tall buildings, like um, skyscrapers in Chicago and New York City, they're measured sometimes by the top of the lightning rods. So the lightning rods have gotten out of control because it makes the building taller. So they can set records and they build a high rise. This high rise is taller than that high rise because we built it this many stories tall. <sighs> this Who many cares feet. about that? And then, well, we've talked about this with, with um, lighthouses as well. The height of a lighthouse is often up to question. Is it the focal plane? Is it where the gallery is at? Is it where the very tip of the lightning rod is at? Mm -hmm. You know, so anyways, lightning rods uh, are prestigious and they're decorative. They got really ornate. Um, and now that's been continued. Lightning rods are also still in use for their original purpose. Uh -huh. But a lot of the ones you'll see are either overly expensive because they want to look nice mm -hmm. and they're useful or they're actually not the lightning rod. And instead they're a just decorative, yeah, non-metallic decorative part. Huh. Kind of interesting. I want to guess that. Who gives a crap about a lightning rod? The first use. Uh, I rescind that. But who gives a crap about it looking nice? A lot of people. No. Including, well, look at this. Destruction on the lighthouse. This looks cool. And part of the cool look to me of this diagram is the pointy top. You like that? Yeah. I think it's cool. I think it adds to it. Something about it. Well. Okay. <laughs> lightning rods were first used on ships because oh. ship masts stand out yeah. and they had metal components to them often. So they were Makes struck sense. by lightning and they'd be destroyed if not start a fire. Yeah. Oh, like have you ever seen a tree get struck by lightning? Oh my God. It'd be the same. Sometimes they explode. I know. Or so they at least tip over. The lightning will take chunks out of, so it'll, it'll ruin a mast and then a ship oh, yeah. will be lost at sea or they can't get back or they can't repair. Like they don't have extra lumber for the main yeah, mast. It's not like you can so rebuild it. That was the first use was on ships because it was so important. They can also take chunks out of buildings, like lightnings that are struck by buildings. Yeah, lightnings that are struck by buildings. <laughs> oh my gosh, this coffee is awesome. Um, like, so anyways, ships were the first use. And then I've got to show you this next image. 
lightning rod fashion. How do oh. you have all that? Hold on. Fancy Sorry. going on. Here's, here shows the cable. So we talked about the... Oh, yeah. This is actually on a lighthouse. Oh, there's a security camera. Look but at that cupola. You can see modern technology. <laughs> modern technology of a security camera and a cell tower and then also our old OG cable going to ground. Yes. Which is outside of the uh, lighthouse for best Is it design. surrounded by something that keeps it from uh, transferring the energy to all the other metal that it's touching right here? Is it like surrounded by rubber or something? No, they're not insulated. It's it's open and exposed and that actually helps with the carrying of electricity. So it's, again, it's it's following the least path resistance. So that's a big gauge wire, a large diameter wire. Yeah. And uh, it's the best, it's the easiest path for electric, electricity to follow. So therefore electricity follows it and not being transferred into other metal that it's Which touching. is confusing because if you see a lightning bolt, it's not just a straight line. There's like branches everywhere. Yeah. So w- why would it be that it would perfectly follow this cable even though it's touching a bunch of other metal? Like if you were standing and holding onto that balcony, would you not be in trouble? I don't think so. I think you'd be protected. It, it makes sense that they, uh, they wouldn't lean it up against it like that unless it wasn't of any danger to anyone. Yeah. For anyone asking, we're looking at a picture uh, where there's a cable laying across the top of the cupola and the uh, the lantern gallery. Yeah, so here's Ooh, another picture. Cool. So this is a. Uh, I wanted to bring this up because you can see it's damaged. Yeah. The so lightning takes an effect on the system, and this is like, not something I wanted to find out because lightning does strike twice in the same place. Yeah, especially um, here. Especially where it's where we're trying to get it to strike right this, on yeah. a lightning rod and this lightning rod you're showing is like eaten away is it yeah. corrosion or is it like blast off pieces of it it's it's a form of corrosion okay. from lightning strikes yeah so cool. they'll they'll take off well and lightning is thousands of degrees Fahrenheit. yeah it's extremely hot so the metal that you know gets in contact with the strike is not going to last very long so this is a i don't remember where this is at oh you know what it's called gay head lighthouse i can't remember where it's at Yep. And this is what I'm super excited to show you. <laughs> All right. After 1778, shortly after Benjamin Franklin introduced the lightning rod, Paris saw a fad <gasps> for umbrellas and hats no. that made use of new technology. A chain ran from the accessory down to the ground and would, in principle, carry the electricity from a lightning strike harmlessly to the ground. Lightning. There's ladies in hats. Lightning rods did not become popular <laughs> in the United States, even to protect structures until the 19th century. You'd think you'd be worried about your hat, your your hat being pulled off. If there was something dragging along the ground attached yeah. to it. So these chains were almost always made of silver, and that's what I was saying. Oh, is, can you imagine wearing a silver chain that goes to the ground, five six feet to the ground, seven fancy. feet dragging along? Very fancy. Like, oh, it was a thunderstorm, but we're headed to the ball. Let me grab my <gasps> lightning grab rod my hat. Lightning and resistant hat. Look at that! Look at that umbrella. Can you imagine the cost of that thing? A long spike. It's like the it's like doubling the length of the umbrella with yeah. the uh, rod coming. You can't out. open that thing inside if you even wanted to. <laughs> you could barely even get that on a bus. <laughs> it's pretty wild. So you'd consider that a weapon. Well, it's they did. Probably pretty pointy. I think it's crazy. So I really enjoyed this, but this mm. is the end of our history buoy. Very interesting. Rods. I I think there's probably more to learn. Maybe an electrical engineer could talk to us about like cable carrying yeah. current. The question about whether or not it would transfer to other metal surfaces yeah. just by touching it. I also want to look up how many lighthouses like didn't have lightning rods. I'm sure that... Oh, damage it, from lightning? Yeah, maybe. I mean, considering that this... Well, no, there were some light um, lighthouses built long before mm-hmm. this. So I want to see how many lighthouses have been destroyed by lightning before. That'd be interesting. Well, and like... This comes back, we had a culture comment uh, or conversation months ago, but like, you know, there were skeptics. Yeah. Like a lot of skeptics. And they're like, oh, you put a rod on top of the building or on your hat and it saves you from the God's power above. Like, yeah. mm. Or it'd be interesting. You'd be like, how do you know that you're not attracting lightning where there would be no lightning at all? Well, and like, if you go, I don't know, this is not advice people, but I think we talked about lightning safety once. Like if you go on a walk in a thunderstorm condition, you can't see the lightning always, but it, it is being developed. And yeah. sometimes you'll be around the first strike that you'd see close by. And so it's like, do or don't. <laughs> Hi, Bo. 
He's helping us. Got his chin on the recording board. He's like, I will adjust these when necessary. He's a good cat. So sorry for interrupting. Oh, I don't know what I was saying. Oh, walking in lightning storms. So I think the the recommendation is that you do not walk towards tall items. So imagine you're like in the woods or a field. You yeah. you're a farmer in a field. It starts mm-hmm. to be you know lightning conditions. You shouldn't walk towards large trees because they might conduct the lightning strike. Yeah. And in that case, explode or send wood shrapnel or set a fire collapse. Okay. But what if you're in the middle of a field and you're six foot five? Like, aren't you the lightning rod at yeah. that point? Like, well, that, that's you... what they always tell you to lay down whenever there's lightning mm. storm is because you're more likely to get hit because you're taller. Yeah. <laughs> so that's sketchy. But Isn't people that have, gross that people we're have been conducting. struck by lightning and they're okay. Some not. Oh, yeah. Not okay. Definitely. Some have been struck by lightning and passed it. Oh, and they get like bruises on their body that are like in the shape of Burns. lightning. <laughs> yeah, burn is not a bruise. Okay, you're going to have to teach me how you do this. Uh, is this Annabelle? I'm glad you recognized it <laughs> out of this photo. So <laughs> Wait, wait. Uh, this um, slideshow, how yeah. are you doing this? This is Google Slides, also not sponsored. What? Yep. I didn't know they had that. And they're pretty neat. Yeah, I'm definitely going to steal this idea because slideshows on, on our computers are hard. Yep, we got it full screen here. There's no like name I got to crop out. Yeah. Nice. I like that a lot. And you don't have to drag things in. Yeah. All right. So you have correctly identified via an image from, I don't remember when, a long time ago. uh, (laughs) I think 1940s, if I remember right. Sanibel Island Lighthouse. Is that what you're covering today? That is what we're covering today. Dang it. I'm so jealous. Okay. Tell me all about it. Well, if you know something about it that I don't cover, please, let's cover it No, again. I just think it'll be a really interesting uh, coverage. And we've never done a skeleton lighthouse before. So. It is. It is interesting. Um, I want to talk about why I selected this one first. The, the, the note that I have is vacation with family. <gasps> not my family, not my vacation. But a friend oh. of ours, mutual friend of ours, yeah. um, sent me an image after Hurricane Ian. Yeah. And we'll talk all about Hurricane Ian. Um, of Hurricane Ian was September of 2022. And shortly after, she sent me an image of the lighthouse still standing. Mm-hmm. So a little bit of a spoiler in a, a positive way. The lighthouse is still there. Um, <laughs> now that we've discovered lighthouses that are destroyed now, yeah. maybe it's good we do this. Yeah, And it's been there a long time. We're going to talk about the history. i got a lot of things to read from lighthousefriends.com. Thank you again. <sighs> Excellent. We but, love them. And this image is also from them. So, yeah, shout out to our friend, and thank you for, for telling me about this. Very nice. Uh, we live in Kansas City, Missouri, and um, however bad it sounds, I don't watch a ton of news. So, like, as happenings are going on, I'm not always aware of hurricanes coming. We're going to have a couple photos to insert here of Bo the cat He's trying to out. He's trying to hit our, trying to turn off our record button. I watched him go for it twice. He's probably going to be sliding the volume buttons there. No, I, I keep an eye peeled on him. What is he doing? Um, I think he's just wanting to be the center of attention. They both are. He's purring up. Yeah, Joey is here as well. We each have a lap cat going on. So I'm pretty sure she shared with me that they went on vacation here on an annual basis. Yeah. Or several times growing up. Uh, and I'm going to show you on Google Maps where we're going. Awesome. I vaguely remember you talking about that when the hurricane first happened. So here we are, Sanibel Lighthouse, 4.6 out of 5 stars. That's pretty good. 2,000 rating. 2,000. So I'm going to zoom out. Sanibel. Sorry. I was just going to say, and you know some of those reviews are like, it was raining. Yeah. (laughs) They're like, I can't believe it. I couldn't see anything. like, this experience sucked. It wasn't warm. (laughs) So Sanibel Lighthouse is on this east coast of Sanibel Island, which is a string of islands, as you can see, going up the coast. Nice. And we'll keep zooming out. But this is Fort Myers, Florida. So we're on the west coast of Florida. You can zoom back in, too. But Key West is down south. Oh, so it's pretty southern part Mm -hmm. of Florida. Mm -hmm. Um, For those that are familiar, it's Sarasota and Naples splits the difference. Um, So Key West is down south, but... Apparently, Florida has a lot of uh, outlying islands on the West Coast Mm -hmm. towards the Gulf. I didn't know that. Yeah, when you scroll out, they're not even not visible. Gulf of Mexico, but Cuba's down there, which, again, will come into the story later. 
But going back in, um, Cinnable Island is uniquely one of the islands that's not running north and south in this area. It runs east to west. Uh And so Cinnable Island Lighthouse, there's a, a beach right here. There's another beach really popular and then there's a fishing pier there's lots going on on this island for people to go visit Mm -hmm. um hurricane ian has kind of reset that but it's island's still there that that um bridge you can see on the maps is that the one that was destroyed by the hurricane okay it's the only bridge out there i think and it was eliminated it was yeah a a section of it was knocked out which isolated all so all the power was cut off yeah um to the island and travel as well i read coverage um from someone who was on the island during the hurricane oh my gosh and that they were just you know just hoping that their house would hold up and that they were gonna live it's just crazy that people have to experience those kinds of things yeah, yeah. i have a, a lot of glass artists that live in this area too oh, really yeah and they had to they just they didn't they told people to evacuate but they didn't really they keep doing that. Yeah, they didn't really specify that, like, oh, the water level is going to creep up this many feet. Several feet. Your house is going to be underwater. It's like you may not get the brunt of the storm, but there's your. It's going to be flooded yeah. even if you. Yeah, and it's just a, a lot of horror stories of people watching the water just get closer to their house and be yeah. like, okay, like it looks like we're going to have to leave, and then all of a sudden they're fighting for their lives to get out of there. Yeah. I've got a lot to cover with yeah, Hurricane I'm so Ian. sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I actually really appreciate it because it's, I watched, um, I think there's two hours of YouTube video that some guy oh. made oh, on the storm? driving around. Oh, no. Uh, he's driving around with his wife filming and he's narrating what's going on with all these, I don't know the area, but people who know the area, here's this resort, here's what it looks like. Yeah. Here's this store, here's what it looks like. Um, you know, these estates here so on he knows the island really well he's a local guy and then another video that's a, a drone footage which i will show us actually cool um and people in the drone footage comments are like oh it doesn't look that bad uh, and it's like there's no street yeah the, the house many of the houses are gone uh utilities are failed also even if your house is still standing the inside needs to be completely gutted yeah. it's like there, there's nothing that water touches that would survive yep especially rushing floods like this is not it's not just like oh it's just my basement flooded it's just a little stagnant yeah. water down there it's like this is like so hurricane ian which is the focus point right now yeah that was september of 2022 and it stretched um from i believe from cuba all the way up to south carolina was mm-hmm. the impacts maybe even further north wow uh 161 fatalities i didn't know 161 that people passed away damn 13 were missing I don't know if they're included in the assumed dead. Yeah. Um, the total damage in the United States dollars is $113 billion. <gasps> what? Yeah. Third costliest tropical cyclone on record. It is the costliest in Florida's history. So areas Trinidad, Tobago, Venezuela, Colombia, EBC Islands, Jamaica, Cayman Islands, Cuba, Southeast United States, especially Florida and Carolinas. Yeah. So. This is good timing. The other side of the U.S. is about to get hit with a hurricane, too. Yeah, West Coast, which I guess hasn't happened in like 80 years. Yeah. So I wanted to, before we move on from this, this is a, a comment. Um, numerous collectors, because of the east-west running of the island, mm-hmm. it collects tons of seashells. Oh, yes. Tons. It's like one of the best yeah. in, in the world. Um, and, and Lighthouse Beach is one of the best spots. So yeah. numerous collectors flock to the island now known worldwide for its shelling, and combed the beaches, hunched over in what is called the, quote, <laughs> Sanibel Stoop, looking for the perfect shell. I love seashells. It's like my sisters and I were trying to plan a trip to Florida, and we ended up going to Fort Lauderdale, but I was pushing for Sanibel Island because oh, really? of the shells. Because I was like, where's the best shelling in Florida? Hands down, Sanibel Island. So I tried really hard to push for that, but the nearest airport's like two hours away or something. Fort I don't Myers know if it's Tampa. One. Oh, maybe. Tampa, I, I just closed the map, but <laughs> do you want to look at it again? No, no, it's fine. I just Fort Myers is probably not the easiest place to get to. Yeah, I just remember us uh, when we were else? looking it up that the travel from landing in an airplane to mm-hmm. get to Sandal Island was just too it was just too much. Yeah, Tampa's up the coast. Mm-hmm. Sarasota, I know. Yeah, there's plenty of airports, but yeah, right. The cost and None coming from Kansas close. City. 
We'd have to rent a car. Or <laughs> That's one of our challenges, guys, as uh, lighthouse podcasters, is we want to go see more lighthouses. Oh. And I've actually um, told people, hey, we're coming, you know, in September, and we're not going. It's just, <laughs> it's difficult to Logistics get together logistics for us but we love to uh for hear from people we've oh, been really yeah. lucky this year to ha- hear from many people at different lighthouses who are listeners it's been awesome so yeah we love it connects we us to live it. vicariously you. through people who live yeah. near lighthouses so that's the sanibel stoop um <laughs> the causeway so the road the bridge yeah connecting the island to the mainland was not constructed until 1963 so before that time a ferry had transported people to and from the island oh so yeah that, there's your ferry, the Islander. Oh, uh, cute. Nice old cars. Yeah, isn't that cool? That'd be a great job. What is this picture from? Um, so this is the ferry going, ab- about to land on Sanibel Island. Is this from uh, USLHS archives or is this? This is from lighthousefriends.com. Okay. It's one of their four or five images they had referenced. They probably got this from USLHS. Yeah. Just for a note for people, if you ever want to see... Uh, well, the USLHS has an archives where you can find literally everything. It's really? like you can find keepers logs from any period of time, any lighthouse. Um, you can find like um, what's it called? Not biographies, logs. but just um, pages on keepers and oh, stuff nice. that happened at the lighthouse. Pictures of all kinds of stuff. So. Yeah, I thought this was cool. Yeah. Let's see what our next. Yeah, it's a good image oh, too. Very cool. Another black and white image. Um. The first settlement on the island was actually 1833. Oh, my. A small group of settlers petitioned for a lighthouse at that time, but the request was not successful. Because mm, there were so few of them. Neither was a settlement. Yeah. Oh, they, no. They were only there uh, for five years. Oh. So disease and hardship, the settlement was abandoned. Less oh, than man. Five years. Yeah. Well, they're really separated. Uh, so that was the first, uh, first recorded peoples on the island. Yeah. So 1830s. And then to the east, we just talked about that, that bay over there. Mm-hmm. That bay started to grow in business, transporting cattle from the United States who would come down to Florida. Okay. Cattle would get on boats and then they'd be shipped to Cuba. So that was kind of the first um, Pathway. growth of, of uh, industry in the area. Okay. So that necessitated another lighthouse appeal. So Spectacular. Did not mean to do that, but that's cool. This picture he's showing is cool. It's really old, but it's uh, the dock to the lighthouse has a little pathway mm-hmm. with like, it must be like a little fence, but those little bulbous it's cool. things lining the way. It's like, it's almost, it's fancy. Yeah. And <laughs> it's across the whole island at, at the tip. Yeah. yeah. It spans the whole thing. Um, Very cool. 1856, the lighthouse board recommended a beacon was established on the island. No action was taken. Damn. After the Civil War... Which is so crazy all this has happened before the Civil War. Yeah. Another request for finding the lighthouse, uh, funding the lighthouse, 1878, accompanied by the following justification. <laughs> they come forward with reasoning now. Yeah, let's quote it. A lighthouse on Sanibel Island would supply a want that has long been felt for lighthouse between the Key West and Egmont Key. The coastwise, yeah, coastwise trade of Florida is considerable and increasing. A great number of sailing vessels, also six steamers, are now plying between Key West and the ports of west coast of Florida. Vessels bound across Florida Bay make their landfall and take their departure from the southern point of Sanibel Island. Hmm. Uh, Congress, again, was slow, but they appointed $50,000 in 1883. Wow, that's a lot of money for that time period. Yes. Yeah. You think it's partly because they had to ship materials? or uh, Yeah. The... Pa- Yep. Transportation. And one of those um, ships sank. No. <laughs> With stuff? <laughs> yeah, for two no. lighthouses. Oh, my God. So work on the lighthouse began in February of 1884. Um, the structure was fabricated in the north and shipped to the site. So the work, it wasn't built on site, but it was erected there. Yeah. So a 162-foot long T-head wharf was built on piles, which is what we see, um, which allowed materials to be landed for the tower and two square keeper's dellings, which are topped with hipped roofs and supported by iron pilings into the, into the ground. Okay. So two miles from Sanibel Island, the ship carrying iron work from Jersey City for the towers at both Sanibel Island and I think it's pronounced Cape San Blas, B-L-A-S, uh, the ship sank. So crews oh. above two lighthouse tenders assisted by a diver were able to fish up all the pieces to save 
oh. except for two gallery gallery brackets. So like the railings. <laughs> so they had to, except for two gallery brackets. <laughs> couldn't find those. That's so. so cool that they could recover everything. Yeah. I. So the lighthouse this... came out of the water <laughs> before it was erected. They're like, let's uh, let's adequately soak these items and then we'll construct it. They're seasoned. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now they're seasoned by the sea. Blessed by Poseidon. Yeah. 1884 that was. So oh, Maybe that's why it's still standing. Today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They had done some work on it. Oh, dang. <laughs> uh, almost, almost good. Yeah, those, those uh, brackets came from New Orleans. Um, so the, the, both of the towers consisted of four iron legs that were arranged in a pyramid fashion Mm -hmm. around a cylindrical column topped by a lantern room. The lantern was ready to be lit by keeper Dudley Richardson on August 20th of 1884, which is still so long ago. Yeah, it is. Um, third order Fresnel lens or Fresnel lens was, got me, (laughs) graced the tower at a height of about 98 feet. And produced a white fixed light punctuated every two minutes by a brilliant flash. Oh. So I don't know how they do that. Could you see the light at all times? And then it would flash because like it was magnified for. Can you repeat what the, the. So the light's constant white. Okay. And it would flash every two minutes. Um, so there's a rotating component and then you can see the light. Incidentally, like you can it just must be see that right at it, I guess, if you're close. It must be. Oh, so this is why I need to do a history buoy on Fresnel lenses. But it must be that there were no bullseyes on each side. It was oh. just panels. And then one side maybe was just a different color or maybe there was a bullseye that was a different color. Yeah. Interesting. They I'll didn't have. Yeah, look it up. Every time we look at lighthouses, I think that kind of is given or mm-hmm. just not really focused on. Yeah. So the history is not. The technology is not always covered. A couple of engineers always want to know. Yeah. <laughs> so the, but what's cool about this lighthouse, and I'll go to the next photo now, is the, the center column is um, about 20 feet off the ground. So you need, there's a staircase to get to it that's built in as well. Uh, oh. The staircase was lost in Hurricane Ian. Dang. But um, I don't know why that is. I just think it's not necessary for it to go to the ground. I think it was segmented the way it was and it could be built that way. And it's like, it's got the legs. Why would it need the center to go to the ground? It's not a structural component. Okay. Oh the yeah. Structure is all exterior. Oh, so. you would think by looking at it that the center column is what's structuring, like what's keeping it right. in the ground. So they have a ladder that goes up to the base of the column. And then yep. from there, there's a stairway. Yep. Stairway is oh. internal to it. Very cool. Um, so really that center column is just for people to go up and down and nice. potentially um, also the weight system that we've talked about mm-hmm. the clockwork system uh, uh, again I didn't find details on that but the, yeah. I was fascinated by the structure so all the load supporting is on the exterior uh-huh. compared to like a brick tower that yes. we see or concrete tower Interesting. So. you wouldn't think that'd be enough when you look at it there's eight legs going to the ground that look small yeah Just yeah from the bottom to connect it to the ground I don't know, they you look can so see, skinny. you can see there's the four major corners, which are probably the largest load, mm-hmm. and then in between the four corners, there's a segment that goes up, just two segments, and then from there, you just have the four that go up. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Huh. I'm sure it's engineered. Oh um, yeah, I mean, it, if it can withstand hurricanes, then and and its design was used a couple of different times. Different is it brown houses. because it's rusted? It is corroded. Yep. Okay. And it was restored in 2013. Hmm. Um, I don't know the. This says 2021, so this would have been right before. It's a solid decade ago. <sighs> it's still, as far as lighthouses go, that's true. pretty recent. Um, accompanied by his wife and two sons, Henry Shanahan, who was the first keeper, uh, I moved. I thought it was Dudley. Uh, this is 1888, let me think. Oh, oh, I see. You're right. It was Dudley. It was 1884, so he was the first keeper. Okay. Second keeper, I believe. And there's only, I have them listed at the bottom, I think there's eight throughout the lighthouse's history. There was eight head keepers and 23 assistants. 23? Yeah. It's crazy. So Dudley was 1884 to 1892. Shanahan was not the head keeper when he arrived. That's why. Okay. 1892 took over. So I'm glad we got that iron dead. Yeah. (laughs) So he, he moved from Key West in 88, 1888. Two years later, became the assistant keeper of the lighthouse. Uh, when Richardson resigned, Dudley, in 1892, Shanahan applied for the position of head keeper. 
Nice. At first, the lighthouse authorities refused to promote him <gasps> since he was illiterate. Oh, how yeah. do you how do you write keepers logs? You wouldn't. And how do you even be an assistant keeper? I mean, I'm we're just I'm so spoiled. We're born in the late 1900s. Like yeah. we're old now. Well, you know, <laughs> around that time, it's like oh, it's kind of crazy. Literacy. I, I was just thinking about this the other day. Like I would have never learned stained glass if I weren't an apprentice for a stained glass artist in this time period. Like, well, like the modern thing of like working on cars. I don't understand. I like. I'm a mechanical engineer as far as what I studied in school. Sure. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean I can fix cars. Yeah. I just watch YouTube and I'm like, okay, that's how that guy did it. Yeah. He learned it from a book maybe or a master mechanic. But like the things that we're empowered to do today are so crazy. Yeah. It it is like you didn't go to school unless you were going to be a scholar or like a politician or something. It's like if you were doing something like being an assistant keeper, it's, it's more like, you need to be an apprentice for something. Yeah. And I, I remember reading too that one of the, um, can't remember where, oh, Little Ross, I think. Uh, okay. One of the keepers, he was an apprentice for like a boat, something boat oh. related or, I can't remember, but. Uh, Nautical. Yes. And then over time, he had seen the lighthouse so much that he wanted to be a part of that. And that's how he became a lighthouse keeper. So. fascinated by it but like you just didn't go to school unless it was relevant to what you were planning on doing yeah. which was not like today it's like you have to be educated and then you can decide what you want to do yeah. whether that just be through high school or middle school or whatever and there's you know there's pressures through that just like you know i don't know being what 16 17 years old mm-hmm. and supposedly deciding like what your life is gonna be oh disaster i don't know that that was that different actually because yeah, 16 maybe. 17 back then you probably have to be making money yeah you, you gotta pick to be, something you're close to being an adult so you gotta be responsible for something but so that was uh he was illiterate but he threatened to otherwise resign so they gave him the position <laughs> that was easy master negotiator <laughs> Um, after a few years of living in the lighthouse, Shanahan's wife died. I'm not sure how. Dang. Leaving him with seven children. <gasps> oh, good heavens. In town. In town. A widow named Irene Rutland happened to also be living uh, with her five children as a single woman. Oh, my a gosh. Widow. Soon, she and Shanahan struck it off and got married. They combined forces. And they had another son. Oh. And together, they had 13 children. That's a lot. So... Yes. Oh, gosh. <laughs> this is written on the... Needless to say, the family helped run the lighthouse. <laughs> yeah. They have well, a, that's good. one keeper and now 15 assistant keepers. 13 children. Or 13. <sighs> the Shanahans had a pet deer that would race up and down the beach along with a trained cat that would roll over like a dog. Good cat. <laughs> Henry passed away in 1913 after 23 years at the lighthouse. Wow. But his son, Eugene, who had served... Uh, is it his son? Yeah. Served as a lighthouse assistant for several years. Uh, would later come back, 1924 or so, 11 years later, to carry yeah. on the family's connection to the lighthouse. Kind of neat. Clarice Rutland, one of the stepsons. Oh, Clarence. I'm sorry, Clarence. Uh, served as an assistant keeper from a stint in the 1920s and again in the 30s. So the family was around for a while. You had yeah. that many kids. You know, Rutland left the uh, description of the daily routine of the lighthouse. I'm not sure which one. Which Rutland? There were two men at a time. We changed watch each night at 12. I'm assuming midnight. Uh-huh. It was an oil light then. We'd take a five-gallon can up full in the afternoon, pump the light, and bring the can down empty in the morning. Just crazy. Five gallons. Is it's always five gallons. Those Home Depot, Home Depot buckets are five gallons. Oh, Crazy. So heavy. Uh, somebody had to be with it almost every minute, it being the light. Yeah. During the day, we had curtains we hung around every one of those prisms. Mm -hmm. So, a lot of work, which is nothing new for lighthouses, but it's always crazy. Yeah. Um, Another key event in 1919, the assistant keeper was shot and killed. What? Yep. Where? In Fort Myers Press, June 23rd of 1919, reported that Jesse W. Lee of Fort Myers had shot and killed Richard T. Berry, assistant keeper of the lighthouse, the day before around noon. Uh, after Barry had reportedly insulted Lee's wife and refused to apologize. Five months later, a jury in Fort Myers acquitted Lee of the murder. (gasps) He admitted killing the assistant keeper, but claimed it was in self-defense. Wait a minute. I think I've heard this story before. No way. Yes. 
No way. Like, why? Was well, this a story where he went and got his gun from the house and then came back and shot him? I'd have to look it I up. I don't know. Because I, I, either something very similar happened to somebody else. I'll have to. But it's in the station's logbook that the head keeper, um, Charles Williams, yeah. uh, received word about 1.30 that his assistant had been shot and killed the day he was killed. Was it outside the lighthouse or was it like It out? was in town, I think. Oh, okay, then never mind. Oh, business. Yeah, I think he was off. I think he was off duty. The next day, the next day, the lighthouse tender ship Ivy arrived at the station with the, bringing with Mrs. Barry, oh. who is the wife of the yeah. deceased, and a new assistant keeper. Oh, my gosh. The next day. They're like, we had this guy lined up ready to go. <laughs> yeah. He was only uh, 45 years old. They took him to Key West for burial. Uh, he'd been in Key West as an engineer okay. before his role as a keeper. Dang. 1923, the dwellings were modernized, receiving oh. indoor plumbing and bathrooms and enclosed porches. Actually, it sounds like a great place to be. Yeah. Same year, the light was converted from kerosene to acetylene gas, which is like those um, small lanterns you pump up, you mm. pressurize, and they glow white. Oh, yeah. I think wow. that's acetylene. Um, roughly 670 acres were originally reserved for the lighthouse, but by 23, 1923, uh-huh. the boundary of the station uh, property extended only 1,000 feet west of the lighthouse. As we've talked about before, islands are moving. Mm. So it was getting a little tight. Yeah. (laughs) Um, There was a Coast Guardsman named Bob England. He came to the lighthouse in 1946 with his wife, May, and infant daughter, Margaret. The following year, a hurricane caused severe erosion of the island and left one of the dwellings standing in a foot of water. Due to, uh, in part, to concerns of erosion, the lighthouse was automated in 1949. So that was only... Three years after he arrived, yeah. this particular keeper. Okay. Um, England was assigned to the Fort Myers Coast Guard Station from where it continued to serve as Sanibel Light Island along with other gates navigation in the area. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of interesting and like, oh, there's corrosion going on. Maybe that's one of the reasons the tower is built the way it is with the main component not on the ground. Because it would just invite too much. Well, I, I, the elevation of Sanibel Island is three feet uh-huh. above sea level oh so so they just assume at some points it'll be flooded uh, maybe i've never considered that until just now huh. um so even though he moved away the dwellings were not really ever empty mm-hmm. um the island had a, a large part of it in 1949 assigned to the j n bing darling <laughs> national wildlife refuge which is still there okay which is really nice it's a gorgeous section of the island um charles LaBeouf. Lived in the assistance keeper cottage uh, for 21 years, starting in 1958. So people, they, they were rented out, or mm-hmm. you could buy them. They were rented out, and I think up until now, I know I'm going to mention it. I've got a lot. I'm just reading here. I'm sorry, guys, but I think it's really interesting. Oh yeah. But I'm pretty sure they were occupied by government officials that, uh, for taking care of the lighthouse grounds, that was their rent. So they were they were rented in a way. Okay. Uh, and they're owned by the city. Yeah. And yeah. I'm going to shortcut part of this. On the shortcut says they went from the Coast Guard who stopped taking care of them to the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, mm-hmm. which is big up in Montana, Wyoming. Uh, and then Bureau of Land Management sold it, almost gifted it to the city. So the city owns the lighthouse again uh-huh. and, and still manages it. Okay. So that'll fast forward us some in this story. Sanibel County Council awarded almost $270,000 to a company in 2013 to restore the lighthouse. Um, in that restoration, they replaced this company replaced sections of deteriorated steel on the tower, then sanded and painted the exterior. Um, the city of Sanibel certainly showed its commitment to preserving the lighthouse property. Mm-hmm. 2016, the lighthouse dwellings were added to the city of Sanibel's register of histori- <laughs> register for historic sites and structures. Okay. Or the risk is there, is there. the risk of my Lots of those. So I just, I don't know. I think it's pretty neat. Um, those dwellings are gone now, aren't they? They are. Dang. Ugh. Here's before and after Hurricane Ian. Oh, no. This is oh, actually no. the image. This came from Instagram. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. This is actually the image that our friend had shared with us. Ah, uh, it's just it, the island. <laughs> Everything's gone. It's, and it's so. It changed the uh, silhouette of the island entirely. Like yeah. that's, it's so, it ate away. I mean, that's got to be, 
How many feet do you think that is that now it, the, the water is right next to the lighthouse? 100 feet of beach are yeah. gone. So much vegetation destroyed. The fishing dock was gone. It's Houses up there. are gone. Everything's gone. Yeah. Oh, they are the other dock. Yeah. So we'll, I got more coverage on that. Oh, Hurricane, on that. Uh, September 22, Hurricane Ian, Category 4, Category 4 storm, ravaged Sanibel and swept away two keepers dwellings at Sanibel Island Lighthouse along with the oil house and uh, a portion of one of the four main legs that support the tower. Yeah. A section of the causeway leading to the island collapsed during the storm, leaving the island cut off from immediate aid. Um, the pieces, get this, the pieces of the support leg lost from the storm were later recovered. No. Yeah. Yeah, There's, that's insane. That's barely any material. They found it. <laughs> a structural engineer hired to assess the damaged structure found it, uh, the structure to be structurally sound with three legs. Ooh, uh, no, so it's just left like that? They, they, they repaired it. it. Oh, okay, that so, would have been awesome though. The, um, the stairs were gone, so they had to use a ladder to even get to it. And he's like, yep, this thing's good with his inspection. That's insane. That is crazy. Um, oh, yeah, that other leg was just for show. Like, yeah, ah. Also, how crazy would it be th- like when you see how much sand has been moved by this storm? Like, that's it's shocking that it wouldn't just be buried beneath yeah. f- 10 st- feet of sand the somewhere. The fact that it's standing. Yeah. Just the, the tower. That's what it's made for. That's why they do skeleton lighthouses. It's just they have just the wind resistance, you know. Less it, surface area. Yeah, the the, the wind just strength. goes right through it. There's no, it's not taking the brunt of any high winds. It just goes straight through the lighthouse because yeah. it's just a bunch of pipes, basically. Strong stuff. Um, so after Hurricane Ian, the Florida Lighthouse Association provided sixty thousand dollars in emergency funds to help repair. Um, Sanibel Island, as well as Boca Grande Lighthouse and oh. Gasparilla Island Lighthouse. I'm, my pronunciation is I think those are nearby. Sure. They are. Okay. I, I checked into them. Yep. Uh, five months to the day after Hurricane Ian nearly toppled Sanibel Island Lighthouse, a relighting ceremony was held at the base of the tower early in the morning of February 28th. The reactivated lighthouse served as a literal beacon of hope as an island community continued its recovery. It's giving me Very chills. Nice. Did they, uh, so did they um, have the same flash pattern for the lighthouse? Did they change anything about it? No. Or, okay. No changes. That's good. I think I had other images that were proud and cool, but I had one from the base of the tower that showed the scale of those houses and how oh, big they are. Yeah. And now that they're gone, I just, I, I'm dumbfounded by how the tower is still there and all, it's gone. Yeah. Everything's wiped completely clean. Um, like even there's not even any indication of foundations there anymore. Yeah. Also, I just realized those keepers' cottages are enormous for just having Very one nice. head keeper and an assistant sometimes. Very nice. That's I think they had multiple assistants at a time. Very big and fancy. Oh, they had like second and third assistants? Yep. Interesting. I wanted to show you this. A little bit out of order, but this is, so the city of Sanibel, their website is mysanibel.com. Okay. But you can go to Lee County Hurricane Ian Damage Assessments. This is my type of research. I go clicking. <laughs> and clickin'. this is, to me, is crazy. I go clicking. <laughs> I'm clicking. Stop. <laughs> clicking, 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 clicking. All right. So this shows the county. That's why the borders are where they're at. Whoa. But the, here's Stanibel Island. These are all incident reports of damage. So the only... It, here, this is non-residential and non-commercial. This is the lighthouse, or lighthouse. This is the wildlife reserve up here, this oh. area. But everywhere else. So these else, are all like buildings they're talking about? Yeah. So you can actually go look. So reds are destroyed. Yeah. Major damage, minor affected. For 15, everyone 000. not on the Instagram, we're looking at a, a map um, on the website that shows little pins all over where there was a house that was destroyed or had any sort of level of damage and at the tip is of course the lighthouse cottages yep. destroyed <laughs> so it's destroyed so it's only foundation remains is the description oh. of the assessment and then if you go down i think it shows the address and i looked up the address yep 114 periwinkle way periwinkle i'm pretty sure that was one of those two that's interesting because uh often leading to a lighthouse like this road that you can obviously see in the map yeah. they're usually named lighthouse way huh it, from what I've seen, you know, it's like a large percentage of 
the road names have something to do with lighthouses, and this one's just periwinkle. It's really it's cute. That's a that's a cool oh, here map. You go. So that's just residential. Oh no! You can show commercial as well, and you know it's a big uh, tourism area, so it's packed. It's a packed island. Yeah. Five hundred thirty-five million. Is that million? I don't know. It goes off the page. <laughs> yeah. Man. Major three billion. Miners, two billion. Total damages. Almost seven and a half billion dollars. That's in the county. That's from one storm. In the county. Can you zoom in um, on the, the point at the very end again? Because uh-huh. it doesn't say anything about the lighthouse. 153 Paramicle Way. Oh, oh so no. that's that's another building. These are louvers. Looks like a door. Wow, the door got blasted inward. That is pretty, Holy cow. pretty crazy. They have pictures. If you click on each uh, pin, they have some of them have pictures of the damage. And there's this door. That <laughs> it's a door that's still connected to the wall that was just blasted in. Yeah. So people are like, oh, it's just flooded. No. It's like, nope. It's like punching it's through walls. Pretty wild. Total losses, <sighs> major damage. This is just all these homes all of them like almost all of them have a pin we go just commercial these so are all businesses is this all water so like between all the houses is water i think so you think that's from the storm or is that was that intentional because they might have they those are just, intentional oh yeah they're People like have channels their boats in their backyards oh, so cool but you know some of these channels so don't cool. connect to the ocean really yeah i was just looking like this one doesn't seem to connect anywhere. Wow. I bet you it gets out somewhere. We're in. We're invested now. So they can go under that yeah, bridge. Under bridge. Oh, there it is. Oh, yeah. Out north. There's Lighthouse Way. Oh. <laughs> There's always one somewhere. Oh, do you think the light? No. I was going to say, you think the lighthouse used to be in a different location? Battery's going to die on us. Oh. Um, Crap. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. I think it's been allocated. It was built over here. So, but okay. kind of interesting. Um, and then I was going to show you the aerial YouTube view, but I don't think we need to cover that. Okay. It just shows. Uh, we can uh, put the link in our show notes so other people can watch it. I'll put it up while we're closing out here. Okay. And a comment. One last note. Someone left a note on lighthousefriends.com. Craig writes, the Sanibel stoop thing isn't just a catchy phrase. It's for real. During a visit to the island property on a Sunday morning in 2006, we encountered dozens of people patrolling the beach looking for the perfect seashell. And yes, a lot of the time they're bent over all <laughs> at the waist. <laughs> One guy with a netted sack, netted sack uh, apparently made for shell collecting, waited about 10 yards offshore and seemed to be having the most success, judging by his fullness of his sack. <laughs> I was dying to join in on the fun, but unfortunately I was attired for church and soon had to leave for the other form of worship. Uh, Thank you, Craig. With so a K. much fun. I love shelling. Yep. I have definitely stooped over when I'm looking for seashells, and I got my knitted sack. <laughs> yep. Oh, it's like the one time that you and I were on vacation, and I found a shark tooth, and I was like, "Oh, how cool! I've never seen a shark tooth." And then I realized by talking to the other people who were shelling that they were all looking for shark teeth, and I had just happened to find one when I wasn't looking for them. I was like. Oh yeah, I just I just found one, so they're around, and they were like, "Oh, you know, get back." <laughs> it's so crazy. It's like it is a discipline. It is like a, it is like a way of life. Some people with the shelling. Well, you know, when you take me on beach yeah. vacations, I'm like, "Well, we better get up at five so that we can beat the other people to shelling." You're like, "What?" <laughs> All right, I'm gonna insert a picture right here, Emily, oh, no. on her knee scooter after needing surgery. Didn't know it at the time. Uh, we literally got an all-terrain knee scooter. I carried <laughs> the scooter, and Emily crutched all the way across the long beach to get to the water so you could ride her scooter to shell. Although, I will say... <sighs> Dedication. I w- it, first of all, this was not an area that had shells. It was... Um, where were we? Hatter Banks. Hatteras. Yeah, okay. It was not a... It had some shells, but... It had some, but they were It was probably weren't. already picked over. Yeah, and um, I'm going to insert a picture here of uh, Vince holding out shells because uh, it was too hard to do it on my scooter. So then he took my place shelling. Do you have a picture? I do. Nice. <laughs> All right. Well, um, as always, we appreciate you guys listening. Yeah. This is a fun episode for me, more professional than my last one. Yeah, thanks for covering this one. Yeah. I, you could tell from my excitement is that I... Florida's got a ton yeah, of lighthouses. Yeah, they do. Yeah. 
And it's fun to uh, have a recommendation from a personal friend of ours here mm-hmm. in Kansas City. We love it when people yep. give us suggestions. Always. Anyone who lives near a lighthouse, just send us an email. You don't have to tell us stories or anything. Just say, I live near this lighthouse. You should cover it. It's a fact. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. You know where to find us, the lighthouselowdown.com. Mm-hmm. Also on Spotify, YouTube, Instagram. Everywhere. Everywhere, all the time. We're not on Twitter, but. Oh, yeah. That doesn't just exist anymore. That. Now it's just X. Oh, something. we're, yeah. We're never on X or Twitter or whatever. <laughs> Anyways, um, yeah, reach out to us. We appreciate it. And thank you for listening to Lighthouse Lowdown.